Ever think about the rulers of old? Not just the famous ones, but the terrifying, the fierce, the ones who truly instilled fear. Dive back in time with me and let's uncover one of history's most fearsome kings, the Assyrian Empire, with its vast territorial expanse and intricate political machinery, stood as one of antiquity's mightiest realms. Located primarily in what we recognize today as parts of Iraq, Syria, Turkey, and Iran, the empire's grandeur and might resonated throughout the ancient world. And at its helm during one of its most influential periods was King Ashurbanipal. Born as the heir to the Assyrian throne in the 7th century BCE, Ashurbanipal inherited a legacy of war and dominion. But what set him apart from his predecessors wasn't just his lineage or his vast empire. It was his unparalleled cruelty and his insatiable thirst for knowledge. The city of Nineveh, the Assyrian capital, bore witness to both these facets of the king. Giant reliefs that adorned the walls of Ashurbanipal's Grand Palace recounted tales of his military campaigns in astonishing detail. In one of these stone narratives, defeated rebels can be seen subjected to harrowing punishments. Scenes depict enemies being skinned alive or impaled on stakes, grim spectacles meant to instill fear and ensure loyalty among friend and foe alike. But Ashurbanipal's tyranny wasn't reserved only for the battlefield. Within the heart of his empire, he erected an intricate network of spies. This Orwellian web ensnared everyone, from the commoner in the marketplace to the highest-ranking officials. It ensured that dissent was stifled and rebellions crushed even before they could take root. Loyalty in Ashurbanipal's empire wasn't a virtue, it was a survival mechanism. Yet for all his fearsome reputation, there was another side to Ashurbanipal that often goes unmentioned. He was an ardent patron of the arts and had an insatiable hunger for knowledge. This passion led to the creation of the library of Ashurbanipal in Nineveh. It wasn't just any library, it was among the ancient world's largest repositories of knowledge, housing tens of thousands of cuneiform tablets. These texts, written on clay, covered a vast array of subjects, from medicine and astronomy to poetry and myths. This duality in Ashurbanipal's character is both fascinating and perplexing. On one hand, he was a tyrant, feared by many, with tales of his cruelty echoing through time. On the other, he was a visionary, dedicated to the preservation of knowledge and the promotion of arts. It's a stark reminder of the complexities of human nature and the fact that history often isn't just black and white. It's a myriad of shades, shaped by the choices and ambitions of those who once walked the earth. Ancient Egypt, with its towering pyramids and sprawling temples, has always been a land of mystery and magnificence. The flow of the Nile, which nourished the Egyptian civilization, bore witness to the rise and fall of many pharaohs. Among them stood Pharaoh Pepi II, whose rule is a mosaic of achievements, eccentricities and enigmas. Pepi II's reign is historically significant due to its incredible length. Ascending the throne as a mere child around the age of six, he would go on to rule for an estimated 94 years, making his reign one of the longest in history. While the longevity of his rule is a subject of admiration, it's the intricacies and peculiarities of his reign that make Pepi II a truly intriguing figure. Let's delve into one of the more bizarre tales associated with him, his aversion to flies. Now, Egypt's warm climate and the presence of the Nile meant that flies were a common nuisance, but for Pharaoh Pepi II, mere fly swatters wouldn't do. Historical accounts suggest that the Pharaoh had a rather unique solution. He would have slaves or servants smeared with honey stationed near him. The idea was straightforward but ingenious. The flies would be more attracted to the sticky sweetness of the honey than to the Pharaoh, allowing him to go about his royal duties undisturbed. This tactic, while seemingly eccentric, offers a glimpse into the mindset of the rulers of the time. The pharaohs were seen as godlike figures, embodiments of divine right on earth. In such a world, even the minor inconvenience of a fly buzzing around would be deemed unacceptable. The honey-covered slaves were not just a practical solution, but also a symbolic assertion of the pharaohs' elevated status above common mortals and mundane annoyances. But Pepi II's reign wasn't just about unusual tactics. The latter part of his rule saw the old kingdom of Egypt waning in its glory. Administrative decentralization began to creep in, and the once unified Egypt started showing signs of fragmentation. Droughts too played a part in the difficulties faced during his rule. 
The mighty Nile, which had been the lifeline of the Egyptian civilization, saw reduced flooding, leading to crop failures and food shortages. There are speculations among historians about the correlation between Pepi II's extraordinarily long rule and the challenges faced by the Old Kingdom. Some argue that the challenges sprouted from the inertia that often accompanies long reigns, where adaptability to changing circumstances becomes limited. Additionally, archaeological and hieroglyphic records from Pepi the Ku's era show a pharaoh deeply involved in religious rites, trade expeditions, and even expeditions to the far south in what is now Sudan. These expeditions primarily aimed at procuring incense, ivory, and other exotic goods for the royal court. In the grand tapestry of ancient Egyptian history, Pharaoh Pepi the King stands out not just for the decades he spent on the throne, but for the multifaceted nature of his reign. From quirky personal habits to profound administrative challenges, his rule encapsulates the ebb and flow of an empire and the human stories that knit it together. Nestled amidst the ancient landscapes of Anatolia, which now constitutes much of modern-day Turkey, the Hittite Empire was a powerhouse that often gets overshadowed by its more renowned neighbors, like Egypt and Assyria. However, for those who delve into its rich history, the tales of its kings, their conquests and their ambitions offer a treasure trove of insights. And standing tall among the Hittite kings is Supilulium Abrant, a ruler whose ambitions, strategies and sheer force of will reshaped the political landscape of the late Bronze Age. Supiluliuma why ascended the Hittite throne during a time of upheaval. The empire, though vast, was beleaguered by internal conflicts and external threats, but the young king, rather than being daunted, saw this as an opportunity. He began an aggressive campaign of expansion and consolidation, aiming to extend the Hittite dominion and secure its place as a major player in the ancient Near East. One of Supiluliuma's most audacious exploits was his engagement with Egypt, then under the rule of the beleaguered pharaoh Akhenaten. Ancient texts, particularly the Hittite tablets, chronicle a fascinating episode that seems straight out of a drama. The widowed Egyptian queen, often speculated to be Ankhus Anamun, sent an emissary to Supiluliuma with a desperate plea. She wanted one of his sons to marry her and ascend the Egyptian throne, a move that would have sealed an unprecedented alliance. Supiluliuma, sensing both the gravity and the opportunity of the proposal, agreed. However, in a twist that no one saw coming, the Hittite prince sent for this mission was taken care of under mysterious circumstances. The tragic turn of events set the stage for a protracted conflict between the two empires, but Egypt was not Supiluliuma's only focus. His military campaigns reached far and wide, from the kingdom of Mitanni in the southeast to the Ardzawa lands in the west. Supiluliuma's strategy often involved a combination of military might and cunning diplomacy. He would establish vassal states, ensuring their loyalty through a complex web of treaties, pledges and sometimes strategic marriages. While his conquests brought immense wealth and power to the Hittite Empire, they also brought enemies. Supiluliuma's aggressive expansionism and the subsequent annexation of territories often led to bitter rivalries and prolonged wars. However, it was neither a battlefield nor a political intrigue that would be his ultimate nemesis. As fate would have it, during one of his sieges, a deadly plague broke out among his troops. This epidemic, believed to be the first recorded instance of smallpox, would eventually claim the life of the great king and pose a significant threat to his successors. Supiluliuma I's reign, with its blend of military genius, shrewd diplomacy, personal ambition and tragic ends, is emblematic of the dynamism of the ancient world. His story reminds us of the transient nature of power and the intricate tapestry of human ambition, strategy and fate that shapes the annals of history. The tapestry of Indian history, with its vibrant hues of culture, religion and politics, has given rise to numerous legends and tales. Among the pantheon of Indian rulers, Ashoka stands out not just for his conquests, but for a profound transformation that would leave an indelible mark on the subcontinent's history and beyond. Born into the Mauryan dynasty around 304 BCE, Ashoka was the grandson of Chandragupta Maurya, who had laid the foundations of the Mauryan Empire, one of ancient India's most extensive empires. Young Ashoka was not initially viewed as the obvious choice for the throne, yet through a combination of ambition, prowess and possibly intrigue, he ascended as the Mauryan Emperor in 268 BCE. From the onset of his rule, Ashoka exhibited a hunger for territorial expansion. 
He set his eyes on the rich and culturally diverse region of Kalinga, present-day Odisha. What followed was one of the bloodiest battles in Indian history. The Battle of Kalinga in 261 BCE was not just a military campaign, it was a cataclysmic event that would reshape Ashoka's very essence. The aftermath of the battle was a sight of sheer horror. The ground was strewn with the bodies of the dead, the rivers ran red with blood and the wails of the wounded and bereaved filled the air. Conservative estimates suggest that over 100,000 soldiers and civilians perished, with many more displaced or deported. For many rulers, such a victory would be a testament to their military prowess, a jewel in their imperial crown. But for Ashoka, the sight of the devastation and the realization of the suffering he had inflicted led to profound introspection. Legend has it that after the battle, while wandering amidst the ruins, he came across a Buddhist monk who further kindled his burgeoning feelings of remorse and introspection. What transpired next is nothing short of remarkable. Ashoka, once a fierce warrior, turned his back on violence and embraced Buddhism, a religion that emphasizes compassion, non-violence, and the eightfold path leading to enlightenment. But Ashoka's transformation wasn't confined to personal salvation alone. He believed that as a ruler it was his duty to ensure the moral and spiritual welfare of his subjects. He embarked on a mission to spread the teachings of the Buddha, both within his empire and beyond its borders. All across the Mauryan Empire, he commissioned the construction of stupas known as Buddhist shrines and erected rock and pillar edicts. These edicts, inscribed in the local script, relayed his messages of compassion, tolerance, and the importance of moral conduct. They stand as historical testimonies to a ruler's commitment to ethical governance. One of the most famous of these edicts, the Rock Edict Thirtsiyasaythid, provides a detailed account of the Kalinga War and Ashoka's subsequent transformation. In it, he expresses his deep regret for the suffering caused and underscores his commitment to Dhamma, a term encompassing righteous living, truth and justice. Beyond the borders of his vast empire, Ashoka sent emissaries to spread Buddhism. His children, Mahinda and Sangamita, are credited with introducing Buddhism to Sri Lanka, where it remains the predominant religion to this day. Ashoka's reign encapsulates a journey from brutal conquests to spiritual enlightenment. It's a testament to the transformative power of introspection and empathy. While many rulers are remembered for the territories they conquered, Ashoka's legacy lies in the hearts he touched and the timeless principles of peace and compassion he championed. Today, we are diving deeper than usual into the depths of history, exploring the realm of possible magic, where ancient leaders were considered more than mere mortals. These were individuals of power, cloaked in the aura of divinity, and believed to possess abilities beyond human comprehension. Across various civilizations, from the pharaohs of Egypt to the emperors of Rome, leaders have been attributed with godlike powers, leaving us with stories that blur the line between myth and reality. But what evidence exists to support these claims, and how did these beliefs shape the course of history? Let's delve into this fascinating topic and uncover the secrets of ancient leaders with supposed godlike powers. As we take a closer look at the pharaohs of Egypt, these weren't just your typical leaders or kings. They held a status that transcended the everyday life of their subjects. To the ancient Egyptians, the pharaoh was the divine intermediary between the gods and the people. His role was critical, for he ensured the favor of the gods, maintaining balance and prosperity across the land. The idea wasn't just symbolic. The pharaoh played a direct part in religious ceremonies, showcasing his crucial connection to the divine. The grandiosity of this belief is visible in every corner of ancient Egyptian architecture and art. Take, for example, the awe-inspiring pyramids. These monumental tombs constructed with such precision that we today, even with all our technological advancements, are left baffled by their sophistication. These structures were not just meant to serve as final resting places, they were designed to aid the pharaoh in his journey to the afterlife, ensuring his place among the gods. But the tales of the pharaohs are riddled with enigmas and captivating narratives. While many revered their divine leader, others questioned the legitimacy of their godlike status. The conspiracy theorists of the ancient world speculated about the true origins of the pharaoh's power. Was it truly divine or a clever manipulation to secure their position at the top? Ancient texts and artifacts are filled with stories of pharaohs claiming to have been born of gods, performing miracles, and having knowledge beyond the grasp of ordinary mortals. 
The mythology surrounding the pharaoh's divine status was also intertwined with astronomy. The ancient Egyptians were meticulous sky watchers, and they believed that the pharaohs joined the stars after their death. The pyramids themselves are aligned with incredible accuracy to various celestial bodies, showcasing the importance of astronomy in affirming the pharaoh's divine journey to the heavens. The pharaoh's role as a god-king also played a crucial part in maintaining social order. By placing the pharaoh at the top of the religious and political hierarchy, the ancient Egyptians created a system where questioning the pharaoh was akin to questioning the gods themselves. This system fostered loyalty, but it also demanded absolute obedience. The prosperity of the land and the favor of the gods were believed to be directly linked to the pharaoh's virtue and ability to maintain ma'at, the ancient Egyptian concept of truth, balance and order. The pharaoh's influence extended even into the realm of art and culture. Monumental statues and intricate carvings depict the pharaohs in their divine form, often larger than life and surrounded by symbols of power and divinity. The art served as a constant reminder of the pharaoh's central role in society, immortalizing their godlike status for generations to come. As we delve into the annals of history, we find the Roman Empire, a colossal force that dominated the ancient world for centuries. At the helm of this empire were the emperors, figures who wielded unparalleled power and authority. However, their reign was not just a matter of political might, it was intricately tied to divine aspirations and clever propaganda. The Roman emperors were adept at using religious imagery and symbolism to bolster their authority. They portrayed themselves as divine or semi-divine beings with a direct connection to the gods. Augustus, the first Roman emperor, was a master of this art. He claimed to be the son of a god, born of a mortal woman and the divine Julius Caesar, who had been officially deified after his assassination. Augustus utilized this divine connection to solidify his position and assert his authority over the Roman state. The practice of emperor worship became a prominent feature of Roman religious life. Temples were erected in honor of the emperors, and citizens across the empire would pay homage to their divine ruler. This deification was not just a matter of personal ego, it served as a powerful tool of political control. By intertwining their rule with the divine, the emperors created an atmosphere where to challenge their authority was to challenge the gods themselves. Coins and sculptures from the period are replete with imagery emphasizing the divine nature of the emperors. They were depicted alongside gods, wearing crowns of laurels and performing acts of valor and strength. These visual representations played a crucial role in shaping public perception, creating a narrative of divine right and godlike prowess. The emperors also utilized the ancient rituals and ceremonies to their advantage. They participated in religious festivals, offered sacrifices to the gods, and took on the role of Pontifex Maximus, the chief priest of the Roman state religion. These acts served to reinforce their divine status and ensure that their connection to the gods was visible for all to see. However, not everyone was convinced by this divine propaganda. There were skeptics and critics who questioned the emperor's godlike status, leading to tension and unrest. The emperors had to carefully navigate these waters, using a combination of religious spectacle, political maneuvering, and, when necessary, brutal force to maintain their divine image and keep the empire under their control. The divine emperors of Rome created a legacy that has fascinated historians and scholars for centuries, their ability to merge political power with religious reverence showcases the complexity of their rule and the lengths to which they would go to secure their position. They were not just rulers of an empire, they were architects of a divine narrative, crafting a story of power, propaganda and godlike authority that would echo through the ages. Embarking upon a journey through time and across continents, we find ourselves amidst the captivating allure of the Incan Empire, nestled in the rugged terrains of South America. The Incas, a civilization of remarkable complexity and innovation, revered their emperors as divine entities, direct descendants of the sun itself. The Sapa Inca, as the emperor was known, was considered the child of the sun, a living god walking among mortals. This divine lineage was not merely a title, it was the cornerstone of Incan religion, governance and social structure. The Incas believed that the Sapa Inca was the son of Inti, the sun god, and Mama Oklo, a goddess. This celestial parentage endowed the emperor with unparalleled prestige, making him the intermediary between the gods and the people. To maintain this divine connection, 
The Sapa Inca performed elaborate rituals and ceremonies, often shrouded in mystique and grandeur. He would don intricate garments adorned with gold and feathers, embodying the resplendence of his divine ancestry. The emperor would offer sacrifices to the gods, seek their guidance through oracles, and participate in festivals that celebrated the cosmic forces governing the universe. The temples and religious sites across the Incan Empire bore testament to the emperor's divine status. The Coricancha in Cusco, known as the Temple of the Sun, was among the most sacred, with its walls once covered in sheets of pure gold to reflect the glory of the sun god. The Sapa Inca would preside over religious ceremonies here, solidifying his role as the spiritual leader of the empire. The notion of divine rulership also played a crucial role in the Inca's imperial conquests. The Sapa Inca was seen as a god of war, leading his armies to expand the boundaries of the empire. These military campaigns were not just territorial conquests, they were sacred missions spreading the divine order of the sun across the lands. Interestingly, the Incas believed in the immortality of their divine emperors. Even in death, the Sapa Inca retained his godlike status. The Incas mummified their deceased emperors, preserving their bodies for posterity. These royal mummies were not hidden away. They were actively involved in the religious and political life of the empire, consulted for advice and paraded during festivals, a tangible connection to the divine that persisted beyond the mortal realm. Navigating to the east, the tale of divine rulership unfolds within the serene lands of Japan, where the emperors were revered not merely as monarchs, but as direct descendants of the Shinto goddess Amaterasu. Amaterasu, the sun goddess, holds a pivotal place in Japanese mythology and is considered the progenitor of the imperial family. The Japanese emperors through centuries have maintained this celestial lineage, styling themselves as the sons of heaven. The belief is that they are not just descendants but actual manifestations of the divine, bringing the heavenly mandate down to earth. This connection to Amaterasu was not just symbolic, it was a tangible part of the emperor's identity and the way the imperial institution was perceived by the populace. The imperial regalia of Japan, comprising the sacred sword, jewel and mirror, serve as divine symbols of the emperor's heavenly ancestry. The mirror in particular holds a special place in this lineage. It is said to have been crafted by the deity Izanagi to lure Amaterasu out of her cave, bringing sunlight back to the world. This mirror, Yata no Kagami, is believed to be housed in the Ise Grand Shrine, the most sacred Shinto shrine in Japan, dedicated to Amaterasu herself. The rituals performed by the Japanese emperor further cemented his divine status. He would partake in elaborate ceremonies praying for the prosperity of the nation, the fertility of the harvest, and the well-being of the people. The Daijosai, a major rice harvest festival, saw the emperor offering the season's first rice harvest to Amaterasu, reaffirming his role as the intermediary between the divine and the mortal. The divine ancestry of the Japanese emperor played a pivotal role in shaping the national identity of Japan. It created a sense of unity and continuity, linking the present with the ancient past. The emperor's role was not just political, it was deeply spiritual, serving as the living embodiment of the nation's beliefs and values. Even in times of turmoil and change, the emperor's divine status remained a constant. Post-World War II, while the emperor's political powers were significantly reduced, and he publicly renounced his divine status, the connection to Amaterasu persisted in the cultural and religious consciousness of Japan. Interestingly, the imperial palace in Tokyo the emperor's residence, is said to house a sacred mirror, believed to be a replica of the Yata no Kagami, further linking the emperor to his divine ancestor. The emperor's New Year's greeting and his role in Shinto ceremonies continue to be important cultural events, attended and watched by millions, a testament to the enduring legacy of the emperor's divine lineage. The Japanese emperors, as descendants of Amaterasu, offer a captivating glimpse into the world of divine kingship, their story weaves together myth, ritual and power, showcasing the profound impact of celestial lineage on the hearts and minds of a nation. It stands as a living relic of an age where the divine and the mortal walked hand in hand, a tale of gods and emperors that transcends the sands of time. And as always, I hope you enjoyed our video today. Thanks for watching.